Now, first thing we should do today is we should go over the syllabus. Okay, so let's see what we're going to learn in this course. Another thing specific to our section actually, uh, I use a tablet PC as you can see. I'll write my notes here. At the end of each lecture, you will actually have access to lecture notes. Okay, so we're going to use Moodle and you'll have access to lecture notes on Moodle. Let's talk about what we're going to learn in this course. We'll start by something you probably already know, by Coulomb's law. So how electric charges attract or repel each other. And we'll move slowly through electrostatics. That means when charges are not moving, how electric fields are created. Then we'll go on to what happens if we start to move charges. So we'll talk about currents, resistance, and immediately we'll see that when we start moving electric charges, it's not only the electric field that's generated, there is another field, the magnetic field is also generated. So we'll talk about magnetic fields for a while, how currents create magnetic fields. Then we'll talk about the, just the inverse, how you can actually create magnetic fields to create electric fields, that's called induction. And finally, we'll put all of them together to talk about the nature of light or electromagnetic waves. Okay. And that's going to take us to the end of the course. Any questions on the material? So this is a pretty standard course. It's being taught at every major university in the world. Any university which has an engineering or science program has a similar course. Okay. So some of you may be wondering, I'm in industrial engineering, why am I taking this course? I'm in computer science, why am I taking this course? And the, the answer, I hope, will become clear even as early as today. Now, I also have to show you the textbook in case that you actually don't have one. Okay, this is our textbook. Oh, it's so heavy. I'll not bring it. To class. Uh, I would advise you to bring the book to class, but it's really too heavy to carry around. So I hope you have access to it by other means. Now, uh, why would you want to bring this to class? Because each and every lecture day, so every Monday and every Wednesday, there'll be a quiz in class. And during that quiz, you're allowed to access your lecture notes and whatever you have with you, but you're not allowed to talk to each other, okay? So there'll be a quiz every lecture day, every Monday, every Wednesday, including today. All right? Come on, it's not too bad. So, to, now, so there'll be recitations starting next week. Shehnaz will hold the recitation sections. That's the fourth hour every week. So usually on Wednesdays, today, the second hour is a recitation section. Today we'll not have a recitation, so it, it's just one hour. Let's go over grading. It's pretty similar to Physics 101. Is there anyone here who did not take Physics 101? OK, just three people. Uh, you can come to me and ask about the details. Now, there are two midterms. Each one is 20%. The final is also 20%. There is going to be your lab, which is 20%. Homeworks are, again, done by the mastering. Oh, it's not called mastering physics. I think it's called something else, right? The, the, no, it's called mastering physics. OK, mastering physics system. And uh, all the. Basically, everything other than the quizzes, lab work, homeworks, midterms, finals, the grading is done together with all the other 14 sections. Okay? So everyone gets the same exam questions. Everyone gets the same homework. Okay? The only thing that's specific to this section are the quizzes. 
Now, which means I may not be able to answer all your questions about how the course is run. There is a course coordinator, there is a lab coordinator. You should know who that person is. It's Ahmed Erish, Professor Ahmed Erish. And you should get into contact with him if you have any problems about the course, especially about grading. Any problems about the lectures, you can come directly to me. All right? Good. Now, letter grades will be decided. It will be very simple to decide the letter grades because we just announced what the letter bins are. There's a small shift from last time. If you actually want to pass, you actually have to get at least 40% of the grade. Okay, not 35% like the last time. Uh, Midterm dates are set. FZ conditions are set. Uh, there's a, a lot of information on how you can actually register to the homework site. So I'm leaving these syllabus here. You can just distribute them, okay? And you should go to the course web page. There is a copy of the student syllabus there. Any questions you have about how to register to the homework site, to mastering physics, you should ask, not me, but to the coordinator, okay? And I think there is enough information on the web page on how to do that. Now, we're going to use Moodle actively. I'll put all lecture notes onto Moodle, okay? So have your Moodle account ready. I don't know if you have to do anything other than just clicking Moodle on SRS, but that's it. And there is a separate lab web page. If you have already taken the lab in the previous semesters and want an exemption, you should go onto that page. And I think that's all I actually I want to say about how the course will be run. Are there any questions? No questions? Please do not be silent in my course. I actually know this material quite well. I've been teaching it for many years. So I'll get bored. And if I get bored, I'll start talking about things which are more interesting to me, <laughs> which will be harder for you. So try to keep me, keep my feet on the ground by asking as many questions as you can, okay? Don't be worried about the recording. We can edit anything out, all right? You, if you feel that you have a very stupid question, please go ahead and ask it. I can assure you that it's not a stupid question, okay? And even stupid questions are welcome, all right? Please, please do not just sit silently in my class. I'll give in-class quizzes and other things to encourage you to ask more questions and be more active in the class, all right? Now, once again, any questions about the mechanics of the course, how the course will be run? Yes? When labs will start? They'll start on the third week. <coughs> any other questions? Yes? Are cell phones allowed in the class? Cell phones are allowed in the class if, you, if they are silent. Please do not uh, make sure that they don't ring, OK? Anything else? Yes. Will this course be focused on the mathematics in one? OK, so that's, a, that's a actually a great question. Because uh, electromagnetism is one subject where your calculus knowledge, something you learned in math, math will be extremely useful. However, there is also a great deal of physics, physics content in this course. So our focus will be on the physics. But we will require you to use some of the concepts like uh, integration, okay? Some integration methods in this course. But our focus will not be mathematics in this course. There was another question. No? Okay, good. Then let's start. Let's start with this material. <laughs> so this is week one. So we'll start talking about 
electric charge. Maybe <coughs> let me go back to the first question I asked. Are there any industrial engineering majors here? CS majors? Science, quite a few. Why are CS majors taking this course? Why is electromagnetism useful for them? Any ideas? I, I'm, I'm hearing something, I think. Go ahead. I'm not a CS student. OK. But maybe computers working with electric. OK, that's that, OK. So sure, electricity is needed for computers to work. But actually, I'll tell you something more, which, which I find more interesting. It's not only the computers or your cell phones or, uh, or this light bulb working with electricity. We now know that there are four different kinds of forces, what we call fundamental forces in the universe. One of them is gravitation. That's what's pulling us down, OK? <coughs> We've studied that in Physics 101 in detail, right? We know all objects actually attract each other, all massive objects. Then we have electricity and magnetism. Then two more, which are a little bit more exotic. We have the weak nuclear force. And we have the strong nuclear force. So I have four fundamental forces. Now, when I'm holding this book up, it's a heavy book. I'm applying a force on it. Which one of those fundamental forces am I using? The force I'm applying onto the book must come from one of the fundamental forces. Which one? OK, it's not gravitation. Gravity is the weight of the book, right? The Earth, all of the Earth is actually pulling it down. And I'm opposing it by my hand. So my hand. <laughs> is not applying a gravitational force on it. There must be something else. It's certainly not the nuclear forces. OK, it's not, nothing is blowing up around here. It's really interesting if you think about it. The way I apply a force in a daily life, when I push an object, is when you think about the atoms just at the tip of my fingers. What do they have on the outside? All the atoms have electrons on the outside. And on this uh, board, there are also atoms which have electrons on the outside. So when they get very close to each other, what happens? They repel each other. When I'm holding the book up, the electrons at the very edge of my hand are actually pushing the electrons at the very edge, at the very bottom of this book. So this force I'm applying is actually electromagnetic in origin. So electricity and magnetism is responsible for all the forces you see around you. Even something more non-intuitive. Why can I not pull this pen apart? No chemistry majors here? You would have, they would have told me that there are chemical bonds that actually keep a solid solid. And what's the nature of a chemical bond? It turns out it's, again, electromagnetic forces. Okay? So practically everything you see around you, unless you're looking at a nuclear reactor, or God forbid a nuclear bomb blew up somewhere, okay? everything you see around you is mostly electromagnetic in origin. So the way we understand nature depends very much on electricity and magnetism. Okay. So this is almost 
all the forces around us. Now, still, physics is an experimental science. People did not go around thinking about molecules and atoms. What they first did is they noticed that sometimes small objects could be attracted or repelled by rubbing different materials to each other. Okay? And at some point, they understood that there are two polarities, two kinds of charge, electric charge. There is plus charge and minus charge. If I have a plus charge and a minus charge, there is an attraction. So unlike charges attract each other. And if I have two like charges, it's just the opposite. Right? So two kinds of charge. And this is quite different from what we learned about gravity, right? In gravity, we learned Newton's law of gravitation. All masses always attracted each other. It turns out this big there's a big result coming out of this distinction. Because there is no negative mass, when you get big objects like the Earth, gravitational force is very important. Gravitational force is what keeps the Earth bound to the Sun. It makes the Earth go around the Sun. However, when you look at, at the level of individual atoms, individual particles, <coughs> gravity is almost negligible. Electromagnetic force is billions and billions times more strong than gravitational force. Okay? Electric charge is very, very strong. The thing is, it comes in two polarities, and generally, it actually neutralizes. These two charges neutralize each other. And the net electrical force for a big object comes out to be small. Okay? So, so neutral systems are possible. One more interesting thing about <coughs> electric charge. Electric charge is conserved. And I should say, net electric charge is conserved. Now, you know about a lot of chemical reactions. A lot of chemical reactions go on in your body, in, your, in the air, in daily life. <coughs> in chemistry, you always talk about electron transfer, right? So electron itself, or the net charge itself, is always conserved in a chemical reaction. But actually, not only the chemical reactions, if you look at nuclear reactions, if I look at subatomic particles, if I look at the most violent processes in nature, like a supernova explosion, like a star col collapsing, it turns out that the total amount of charge in any process we know of is conserved. You cannot change the net amount of electric charge with any kind of process. So that's really important. And now I'll admit to something. We don't know why this is so. I can actually tell you a lot of fancy mathematics. I can tell you these three forces I actually talked about. They are the sides of a different sides of the same object. Okay. I can tell you the mathematics of charge conservation, what happens. And we'll see some of that mathematics in this course. But to this date, there is no good explanation as to why charge 
is conserved in nature. This is one of the fundamental symmetries of our universe, and we don't have a deep understanding of it. Now, another interesting thing about electric charge is <coughs> electric charge is quantized. What does that mean? Does anyone know what quantized means? Yes? OK, it is like integers. Any amount of isolated charge is an integer times charge of an electron. So you don't have any particles which can be isolated, which has less than the charge of an electron. Anytime you actually transfer charge from one closed system to another closed system, it must be an integer amount of electron charge. <laughs> Again, to be more specific, I should say isolated electric charge is quantized. Now, the thing is, we will really not be bothered about this quantization in this course. And why is that? Because it turns out this is very, very small compared to macroscopic charge scales. Even the simplest electrical uh, phenomenon you can think of. If I you know, rub my hands together and, or my uh, sweater and I get a spark, that has millions of electrons in it. Okay. So unless we are doing chemistry or quantum physics, we will really not be bothered about uh, this quantization of charge. Okay. So in physics 102, you can forget about it. You can think as if charge is something continuous, as if charge can be any real number. All right? Interestingly, we can actually talk a little bit more deeply as to why charge has to be quantized. But for that, you'll actually have to take some more courses from physics department, notably quantum mechanics and uh, maybe field theory. Now, that's great. That's an overview of what electric charge does. But let's actually try to put some numbers, try to put some formulas into this electrical forces. Now, here is the thing. Let's talk about the force between isolated point charges. So if I have two charges, Q1 and Q2, which are separated by a distance r, what is the force between them? First of all, this force has a very specific direction. Its direction <coughs> will be on the line that's connecting these two dots. All right? So F, I'll say, is proportional to R hat. Now that I've taken care of the direction, let me write the magnitude of the vector. First of all, it's linearly proportional to both charges, Q1 and Q2. And it's inversely proportional to the square of the distance between these two charges. Okay. Now, 
You all have seen this in high school, right? So this is nothing new. And what did you call the proportionality constant? You called it? I am assuming k, right? Any other notation? Everyone called it k? Okay. Good. I don't want anyone to use that. We're going to change our notation. We're going to call it. I don't know why I can't. Okay. No. We're going to call it 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0. Now, you may think that I'm making things harder for you. I'm on purpose introducing an extra 4 pi and introducing new symbols like epsilon. But it turns out this number epsilon 0 will come up in other contexts and I'll give you a huge spoiler about the course. Okay? This epsilon zero is called permittivity of free space. In about a month, we'll define something else. Mu zero. So it's the it's a similar constant for magnetism. So here is a huge spoiler. You can just tell this to all your friends and ruin their uh, enjoyment of physics 102. <coughs> Guys, this is a terrible joke, but you're supposed to laugh at my jokes, OK? <laughs> OK. So now. We'll see that 1 over square root of mu 0 times epsilon 0. So something that's related to how magnets attract each other and something that's related to how charges repel each other. What I find is C, which is the speed of light. So that's why we all, anyone who is going into science or engineering, has to learn electromagnetism. It tells us how nature works. More specifically, it tells us the connection between what we see all day about around each uh, us, light, electromagnetic waves, your cellular phone uh, radiation, how it's connected to charges repelling each other and how it's connected to magnets attracting each other. Okay. What I aim in this course, by the end of this course, is that you have a, you know, some basic understanding of what's going on in an electromagnetic wave and how it's generated, why it's so important. All right? Good. Now, maybe let's also <coughs> talk a little bit more about this formula. F is 1 over... 4 pi epsilon 0, q1, q2 over r square r hat. Let's talk about units. Do you know what this formula is called? <coughs> Louder. No, it's not Faraday's law. It's another English gentleman, Coulomb's law. Okay, so this is called <coughs> Coulomb's law. Why do you think Coulomb actually got his name attached to this? What did he do? Well, he took charges and basically took more charges, more charges, and measured the force all the time. He established that force is proportional to charge. And he established that it's inversely proportional to the square of the distance. Okay? So it doesn't get any better than that. He actually experimentally measured this force law. That's why it's called Coulomb's law. So what is the unit for charge? Coulomb. Excellent, right? So he did something important, so let's name a unit after him. 
So a uh, electric charge is measured in units of Coulomb. And do you remember what were our fundamental units in mechanics? Do you remember what we expressed everything in terms of time, length, and mass, right? So these were the three fundamental units. Coulomb will be our fourth fundamental unit because it's a conserved quantity, it's electric charge, it's something new. It cannot be expressed in terms of mass, time, and length. So this is a new fundamental unit. Then, what is the unit for epsilon zero? Let's figure out. We'll, we should do a lot of dimensional analysis. How can I find the unit of epsilon zero? Come on, now I have a formula here, right? F equals one over four pi epsilon zero, Q one, Q two over R square, right? So the unit of epsilon zero must be the unit of force the unit of R square divided by unit of Q1, the unit of Q2. So this should be, what's the unit for force? SI unit for force? Newtons. R square should be meter square divided by Coulomb square. That's it. And it turns out the value for epsilon zero is approximately 8.85 minus 10 to minus 12 Newton meters square per Coulomb square. All right? Now, if we do this, if you're going to uh, spend all this term together, you have to be more alert. Because I very commonly make mistakes. So you should be able to stop me. There's a huge mistake here. Come on, epsilon zero units should be just the reverse, right? Look at the formula here. So divided by F R square. So it should be Coulomb square divided by Newton meter square. Has anyone actually noticed that I was doing something wrong? Why didn't you tell me? I thought you know something. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know anything apparently, right? So always check my algebra. Okay, I may I may make mistakes. I commonly make mistakes and it may be that you're asking a, you're pointing out something which is actually correct but then we'll all learn something okay please do not be afraid to ask questions all right I still find all of you too silent That's, I don't like it hopefully it's I'm, I, I'm thinking it's due to Emre Bey who's recording the lectures okay so don't be shy. Ask more questions. All right? Good. So I'll tell you one more thing about uh, electric charge and electric forces. And then we'll have the quiz. And that will be the end of our lecture today. OK? So Electrical forces are additive. Now this is a simple principle, but it gets a fancy name. This is called the superposition principle. Okay. What do I mean by that? If I have two charges, Q1, 
and Q2. And I actually want to find the net force on a third charge, Q3. The net force on the third charge will be just the vector sum not 1, 2, 1, 3 not 2, 3 it will just be the vectorial sum of the forces due to separate objects now this looks almost immediate to you you say of course I mean why not but this is actually an important property of electromagnetism. Of the four fundamental forces I told you at the start of the lecture, weak nuclear force and strong nuclear force doesn't have this property. They, they, they do not have superposition principle. So, for example, if you want to find the force on one of the quarks inside a proton due to the other two quarks, you cannot just add forces due to separate quarks. So superposition principle is actually a lifesaver. It, it makes our life very easy. Okay? And we're going to use it repeatedly throughout the course. You didn't even notice how important it is until I actually explicitly stated it. All right? Now, any questions about what I told? Does everyone know why they are here, why they have to learn electromagnetism? Oh, come on, because it's, in your, it's, it's, it's a must course, right? That's, that's, that's why you're taking the course. Nonetheless, I think it's really important. I think you'll actually learn a lot of modeling. You'll actually learn, apart from the physics of this course, you'll actually have a great opportunity to think in terms of simple formulas and apply them to complicated systems, as the complicated systems uh, you'll see in your exams, okay? And you'll have the chance to practice your mathematical knowledge in this course, right? If there are no other questions, yes? Uh, the beginning of the lecture, you stated that the uh, electron, electric charge is complex. But uh, if you look at the proton, it has a negative force. So you consider that a complex. So, okay, I said isolated electric charge is quantized. Inside the proton, there are quarks which have charges one third, two thirds, but you cannot isolate a quark from other quarks. There is no isolated quark. They always come in pairs or triplets so that the net charge is quantized. That's a good question. If there are no other questions, let's have our first quiz, okay?